Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 132 RRRD Regional Rural Remote Doctorates. Wow. This vlog comes via request from Kath in Port Lincoln. You are a wonderful human being and she was particularly interested in how we think about and understand students in this environment and also how we improve the PhD experience in these environments. Now I've committed a lot of my life to regional education so I'm absolutely thrilled by this request and it is timely I think for a vlog such as this, because we're starting to see some structural problems emerging in regional, rural and remote environments. Yes, drought, depopulation, we're also seeing a lot of challenges in health and education services, specific mental health concerns that are underserviced by mental health professionals. We're also seeing obesity and other health crises. And alongside the challenge of managing policies that are coming from urban environments and being imposed on the regional, the rural and the remote. Now this is an important intervention. As many of you may remember, this vlog series started so that we could talk directly every single week with our students outside of Adelaide in regional South Australia and also in the Territory. And I always said, and you've heard me say this in these vlogs, if two people and Catherine, a couple of people in Tennant Creek watch these videos, then they are worth doing. Can I say a lot more than that have been watching it, for which we are all incredibly grateful. But there is no doubt that our greatest supporters in the office of graduate research come from regional South Australia and the Territory. We thank you. But discussions of regional, rural and remote PhD supervision is bigger than the Territory and it is bigger than South Australia because every single nation on earth has a regional, rural and remote environment, whether we're talking about Finland or whether we're talking about the fabulous University of the Highlands and the Islands in the north of Scotland. So today I want to talk about, honestly, the specific challenges of doing doctorates out in these environments and how to get your supervision organised in these environments and how we now can use synchronous and asynchronous digital platforms in a way that enables your candidature to be successful. But I want to go a little bit further today. This is going to be quite stroppy and a very honest vlog today. I also want to talk about and with you as an early career researcher and the capacity and the potential of these environments for work for you going forward. Now, you might think, oh, look, I love capital cities. I live in a capital city. I always will. Maybe you won't. The nature of being an academic is we all go where the work is and there is work in regional environments. And if you believe in social justice, if you believe in making a difference, then business as usual in regional, rural and remote environments is no longer possible. We do need some serious interventions and we do need you. And the other huge challenge that I found when I was preparing this vlog is the complete lack of research, the complete lack of theory andragogy in understanding how to supervise PhDs in regional, rural and remote environments. And the amazing thing is, and isn't this a bit horrifying, all the literature is focusing on students going into placements, particularly in health and education, in rural, regional and remote environments. And how staff members go into those environments temporarily to supervise them. And then the student comes home and then the supervisor comes home. There's nothing to address the specific needs of being a student in a regional, rural and remote environment. Isn't that amazing? So today I've tried to bring together lots of interdisciplinary ideas so we can configure a way forward. So let's do this. Two thirds of the Australian population live in major cities. That makes Australia one of the most urbanised nations in the world. But we also have one of the lowest population densities outside of these major cities. So that means, of course, that most Australians, most of the time, 
do not have to think at all about regional, rural or remote environments. They just get on with urban living. We only hear about these regions when stuff goes wrong, like drought or mental health concerns or a large industry leaves these small places. Crime. 1.5% of the Australian population are classified as remote and 0.8% of the Australian population is classified as very remote. So in terms of numbers of people, regional Australia matters. In terms of social justice, remote Australia matters a great deal. And in terms of food security and food production, rural matters a hell of a lot. So where universities exist in this space is in a place called third tier cities. Now I've done a little diagram here as layers of a cake. So if you will, there are three types of cities. The first type is the global city, the big conurbation, New York, London, Sydney, Tokyo. These are huge populations. Many, many universities exist within them. Second tier cities are like Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, Wellington, Manchester, Osaka, Vancouver. They have two to five universities, pleasant to live, good transportation, well-serviced, diverse employment base. Third tier cities, the bottom bed, are located in the regions. And yes, they can be rural. They have small populations, and when they are industrialised and industrial towns, they are often single industry towns. Wayala. Sometimes they exist at the edge of global cities. So if you think about Sydney, you've then got those small cities, Dubbo, Bathurst, Wagga and Albury, that like hug the global city. Sometimes these cities are separated from a main city. So think about Queensland, there's Brisbane, and then you've got Rocky, then you've got Gladstone, then you've got Bundaberg, that are a fair distance away from Brisbane. Now, universities are present in these third tier cities, and you can work there, and they have incredible advantages if you choose to do so. Cheap housing, a small university so you meet everybody, great interdisciplinary work, a diversity of colleagues. Also, particularly early in your career, you have opportunities to experience all sorts of diverse roles in a university that in a major university you probably don't have a chance to do. So you, can, you get co-opted into all sorts of interesting jobs and you get an incredibly diverse experience. You also have a much more direct line to local government. So you can see your work pretty well immediately action. So it's a very exciting place to see impact and engagement. So regional Australia particularly refers to the towns and the cities beyond our capital city. So beyond Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, we better not forget about Canberra, Adelaide, Perth and Darwin. The rural is determined in opposition to the urban and is based in and around agricultural industries. Remote locations are not only configured by distance but also tragically, a lack of infrastructure and services to those places. They are great places to work. I've worked in nine universities in my career and four of those universities have been in regional areas in Australia, in the United Kingdom and in Canada. And I chose, and will choose again, I chose to work there early on in my career and also for more senior posts later on. I know their strengths, and oh yes, I know their weaknesses. I know the value and the potential of these great places. But I also know what we're doing wrong and the impact of what's going wrong on people, on the universities and on the communities we serve. And just a couple more words about definitions too. Rurality is an ideology. It's very, very difficult to define. Rurality is defined in opposition to urbanity. So that means that the rural is defined by that which is not urban. And that means a series of assumptions, generalizations, if you will, come along with the word rural. And a lot of those assumptions are about modernity. And there is an assumption that the rural is anti-modern the rural is boring, that the rural is intolerant of difference. 
So, and what we've got therefore is a series of histories that have valued the urban experience as exciting, as riveting, as dynamic, as wonderful. Now some of those assumptions may have been true, that ideology of urbanity comes from the 19th century and the 20th century. But I think we all know that ideology of the city, the big city now, is starting to be critiqued really in the last two decades and after the global financial crisis it's pretty clear that cities are in some difficulty. And there is a wider international frame to the work I wanted to talk about today. And this is very, very exciting. Is it going to stand up for me? Maybe, maybe not. Oh, it's going to bounce. That's exciting. And I want to talk about one particular book. It's an amazing book, can I say. Jason Servone's remarkable monograph, Corporatizing Rural Education. Corporatizing Rural Education. This is the book my book of 2018. It is that fantastic. And why I particularly want to talk about it, not only is it a great book, it began its life as a PhD. Books matter. So he argued in this wonderful book that rural and regional towns and cities have been buffeted by neoliberal globalization. So what he means is market forces Corporations have seen the brittle nature of these small cities and large towns and have moved on in to make profit. So there's lots of talk about neoliberalism, lots of different definitions, but at its most basic, it argues that the free market and the profit motive must be the dominant idea here. So what we're doing is the market is the most important, profit is the most important, and other variables are secondary to that. So it is anti-state intervention, it's anti-regulation. So if it has a t-shirt slogan, it would be, let the market rip, right? So if money is to be made from something, go for it. That's neoliberalism. It's against regulation, it's against state intervention. So you can see right now the challenges to health and education in under-regulated environments. Mm -hmm. So the global financial crisis of 2008 was really the peak moment in this unregulated ideology. Unsecured loans, derivatives trading, basically the international economy was treated like a poker game. <laughs> like casino capitalism, and didn't that end well? Bless. But this environment had specific and damaging consequences on rural environments in particular. So the argument is you can see why white working class men and women voted for Donald Trump. And indeed, Savone described them as, quote, angry white men and women, end of quote. And he argued they weren't being addressed or validated by any political organisation. But the point of these locations and the role of neoliberalism in these locations is a much more sensitive and careful argument that we can ever make by talking about Donald Trump and voting patterns and stuff. It's much more intricate than that. And Servone argued that, quote, the corporation of rural schools is based on the same ideology that affected rural communities throughout US history. The ideology that shapes rural communities as backward and in need of modernization, end of quote. So this is a really powerful analysis here. Configuring the rural and the regional as backward, summoning that cascade, those labels of like redneck, yobbo, yahoo, gronk, bogan, depending on the nation that you have, happen to be residing in, opens up these environments to these market-driven and profit-motivated programs for supposed modernization. See what's happening here? So the rural and the regional is configured via a deficit model. And the citizens that live in these locations are also supposedly in deficit, requiring the market economy rather than public services to render them modern. Boom. So instead of public providers for health, education, correctional services, neoliberal corporations move on in to these brittle urban environments to extract profit. That's what's happening. So therefore, modernization is meshed with exploitation, and that's exploitation of people, of animals, of the land. 
So education is cheapened, public schooling in particular is cheapened. So with poor schooling, with few alternative providers, it means that ways out, ways, ways through, ways to improve one's life through education start to get truncated. So the labelling of rednecks, a truly dreadful word, the labelling of rednecks, therefore, has nothing to do with the lived experience, the lived reality of working in regional, rural and remote environments. Instead, it is the consequence of configuring men and women and children who live in this environment as lacking, as underdeveloped and, yes, anti-modern. So such an ideology poses particular challenges for those of us who work in universities because regional schools are confronting what's called in staffing terms a churn. So that means there's a high turnover of staff in schools in regional and remote areas which impacts on the quality of the education for those students and therefore it's hard for the students to get a high result and then go to a university. So think about how this ideology operates in South Australia and in the Northern Territory. Think about the ideology, the iconography, the impressions you have of the places beyond Adelaide and Darwin. So think about Alice Springs, Wyala, Renmark, Catherine, Mount Gambier, Port Lincoln. So as a characteristic of these third tier cities and towns, they are incredibly diverse as my list of those cities just confirmed. And of course Flinders has campuses in many of these locations. And the point is this, I want the doctoral experience that you have in these places to be absolutely outstanding, equivalent to what students experience in Adelaide. And my three Ds, digitisation, deterritorialisation and disintermediation, now make sure that I can do that. So we now have the strategies, the interfaces, the platforms, so we can create a suite of professional development and options so that your supervision is delivered on your terms. Just think about the Right Bunch, which is of course our weekly writing group. And I suddenly realised when I was preparing this vlog that the Right Bunch has been dominated by regional South Australian students and students from the Territory right from our first meeting to today. So incredible students and of course we've got the wonderful Anne from Dubbo, we've got John from Ballarat, hi guys. So all these disciplines come together from regional environments and support each other through digitisation. The Right Bunch demonstrates what we can do if you think about regional education properly. So the goal therefore is not to even consider, let alone apply, a deficit model. Instead when I think about regional, rural and remote environments I apply an abundance model. We talk to students where they are rather than where I want them to be. We use Skype, we use Zoom to ensure that they get the supervision they require on their own terms. We now have the strategies in place for that connection and that collaboration. So what I want is the outstanding students that we teach in regional, rural and remote environments to enjoy their family, be able to continue their working environment and ensure that their PhD enfolds around the work they are doing and who they are rather than pulling them out to come to Adelaide to deliver a seminar or do a milestone. So the structural challenges that we are confronting here I think are very clear. Very few universities actually exist in regional, rural and remote environments. And of course, remote environments, very challenging relationships with universities and we're still not getting that right. So therefore, the options that are available for students are restricted. There are three models of a university in third tier cities. The first is the single institution, so the self-standing institution in a small city. So Federation University is an example of that. Southern Cross University is an example of that. Then you've got a regional university with multiple campuses spread over geographical space. So Charles Sturt University, Central Queensland University are examples of that model. And thirdly, there is an outlier campus 
from a main city based university campus, right? And so Flinders is an example of that, so is the University of Western Australia. The third model is the least frequently seen in Australia, but it is the most common model in North America, in the States and Canada. So the challenge, I think, particularly with the first and the second models, is expectations are capped on the students who enrol in these places. Even in that first model, if an institution is enmeshed into a community college, which has so many advantages, so FE and HE talk to each other and very enabling and has widening participation, all of that is incredibly important. But my fear is, particularly if we don't have a doctoral program in a lot of these environments, then we are capping the expectations, the aspirations, the hopes of these people. The point is that, quote, small town Harvard, Harvards, to use Samuel's phrase and example, don't exist outside of Harvard. The type of universities that exist in struggling third tier cities are, no surprise, <laughs> struggling small universities. Everything is more difficult in these environments. The vice chancellors and the senior staff that are hired are often very inexperienced. The deans who are appointed, it's obviously their first role to be a dean for a lot of these institutions. They had a small field of candidates from which to select. And indeed, attracting staff to live in these small cities away from the facilities that exist in the larger urban environments is quite challenging. So we talked about that ideology of rurality and that exists in a lot of people's minds when they're thinking, oh, I, don't, I don't want to leave a main city. I, I love the excitement of a city, even if they never actually leave the suburbs. And of course, the other problem we've got is when a staff member may be hired in these regional or rural areas, they become part of the FIFO academic workforce. So the fly in, fly out workforce. I wish I was joking. So they don't live permanently in the place of their employment and therefore the gown and town relationships are truncated. And think about that. How disrespectful is it that you take a salary from a regional university, but you don't bother to live there. What sort of disrespect is that for the people that you teach and their families? Put that out there. Now, this problem is even worse when we're dealing with remote education, where these locations are simply framed as opportunities for placements for health and education. So in a regional remote environment, we simply send students out there for a bit of country experience and then they return. So we send students out and no authentic, grounded, lived experience in and of that place. These are locations to develop situated teaching and learning. Well, that great phrase from about two decades ago, situated literacies. For example, just over one quarter of nurses in Australia work in a place that has a population between 1,000 people and 100,000 people, right? But that workforce is quite unstable. Again, it sees, sees a churn of turnover of staff, is older than the urban nursing population and has fewer opportunities for professional development and upskilling. But this is not a question of imposing urban knowledge over regional, rural and remote locations. The great Robert Chambers, in his incredible study of rural development, believed it is an unproductive division between urban and rural core and peripheral knowledges. And that means that outsiders to regional, rural and remote environments endlessly offer their opinion, their views, their policies on what needs to be occurring in the RRRs. So therefore, regional, rural and remote environments are by default configured as ignorant and backward. Think about the impact of this nonsense on policy making in these environments. Think about how many universities and regional locations around the world cap the expectations of their students. Why can't students do an authentic, organic, real PhD in Tennant Creek or in Catherine? And can I say a big hello to our PhD students in Tennant Creek 
and Catherine. So this is not imposing Adelaide or Darwin or Sydney or Melbourne or Perth knowledge on you guys. It's about creating a collaborative space where we create new knowledge through dialogue. And that means supervisors change. We transform to ensure our supervision alters and improves when we're engaging with you. We also need to make sure we have outstanding supervisors in these regional locations and that the professional development skills that we create for those staff are bespoke and customised for that environment. So when we're sourcing doctoral supervisory material for these small environments, the absence, the silence is chilling. At their best, universities in third tier cities enable uh, a great phrase that came from Sawala and Mikik and it was, quote, smart diversification. Isn't that a great phrase? Smart diversification, but also stability and perhaps growth. So this is the best case scenario. You are our next generation of academic leaders and you have some decisions to make about who you are and what you believe in. How are you going to create influence? How are you going to change the world? This is personally important to me because both my parents were raised in really, really tiny places, not even towns really. And Kevin, who is now Kevin Brabazon, my father, who's now 90 years of age, bless, uh, was born and raised in Northam, tiny little town in Western Australia, and his parents indeed are buried there. But schooling was uneven at best, and very few people made it from Northam High School to university. Indeed, as Kev said, he much preferred like playing cricket and football than going to school. Having said that, he was pretty good at cricket and football. My mother spent a slab of her childhood living with her grandparents, John and Mary Ryan. Now, he was a sleeper cutter in bowling. Now, you probably haven't heard of bowling, but bowling is about 30 kilometres outside of Collie. You might not even have heard of Collie. But Bowling has a railway siding, a school, some shacks, and John Ryan built that shack that they lived in. And actually, it still stands to this day as a shed on the farm that now exists in that location. But there were 10 students in Doris's school. Most would walk to school or arrive on horseback, and there was one teacher, and Doris was the only student in grade three. Bless. So from these tough places, a long, long time ago, a university must have seemed like it was in outer space. So it's not surprising that I committed deeply to regional education because I want, I really want these strong, different, defiant people to have the opportunity of the best education in the world, not a cut-priced, dumbed-down experience a great experience, as good as anywhere in the world. And this is where I think we are failing in international higher education and we have to do better. And there are many causes for this failure in regional education. And I think the number one cause of failure is, not surprisingly, leadership. Because these locations are framed as in deficit, the leaders who go out into these locations treat it as a career stepping stone. So they go out to get a promotion so they can come back and be a leader in a, inverted commas, real university in a capital city. So this means they go out there, they do some quick work on restructuring and they do a bit of budget work imposing stuff onto these regional locations so they get their CV in place pretty quickly so they can supposedly return to a real university. We see it time and time again around the world. It's a pattern. So the fields for these posts are smaller and they're less competitive because supposedly staff don't want to live there. In the UK now, the situation has got so dreadful in terms of that FIFO workforce fly in, fly out, that when you sign a contract in the UK, you have to commit to living within 20 miles, sometimes it's 40 miles, but 20 to 40 miles of your institution, of your campus. Because it simply got ridiculous in the UK where someone would be living in one city, like Manchester, and working in London. 
And of course, they'd never go to work. You'd never see them on the campus. So that's why the contracts actually changed. So yes, there are problems in these environments. Yes, leadership is an issue. But they are also difficult places to live if you have a spouse who wants to work in some form, and obviously we all do. So without spousal policies in Australian universities, and because these cities are small and lacking that diversity of employment opportunities, families are often very unsettled. So you think about it, if your spouse can't get a proper job for a year, two years or three, you're not gonna stay in that environment. So the family's very unsettled, and of course, people leave. Also, because of a lack of leadership and the desperation to get good staff, really bad stuff happens in these locations. So I'm gonna tell you two truthful stories. These are true stories. I've never spoken of this before, but I thought, hell, let's do this so you can actually see what's happening in these places. So I'm gonna use two stories from regional education, one from the very start of my career and actually one that happened this year. So my second academic post, the year after I returned back from the Wellington gig that I did as a quick in out shake it all about one year job, was in regional Queensland. And I did the day of interviews and I phoned my parents on the night uh, that the interview concluded and I said look I'm not going to take the job the department's a bit weird lots of argument lots of debate looks all a bit unsettled so look I, I won't take this job and I had an alternative I was offered a three-year contract at the University of Western Australia an A-level post but I could go home and of course at 25 you still sort of have a home so it was nice to supposedly go home but the next morning the head of school his first head of school role, he'd just been a professor doing research and teaching before this, the head of school drove me to the airport and he must have had a sense that I wasn't going to accept the job and so he talked at me all the way through in the car and in the regional airport until the moment the flight took off. And he promised me, and I'm laughing because this has become sort of family folklore, and he promised me B and tenure before Christmas. B and tenure before Christmas. So whenever, whenever I say to my father, Kevin, to this day, oh, look, this guy said this. And he went, oh, right, B and tenure before Christmas. So from my background, the notion of permanence, of tenure, being able to settle in a great environment, I thought this was great. <laughs> so I turned down <laughs> the contract post at the University of Western Australia and accepted what was going to be B and tenure before Christmas. And I think you know exactly where this story is going to go. B and tenure didn't happen because the promise was meaningless. I'd been duped. I'd been lied to. And look, I did enjoy the experience of that regional university. And the weird thing is, if the promise had happened, I would have stayed. That's how much I enjoyed it. But 18 months later, I got another job that was B and tenured back in Perth, and I was there for 10 years. So remember from me, get everything in writing. Get everything into the contract, because people lie. <laughs> I always trust people. It's, I, I always trust people, like my entire life. And every single job I've got, someone senior has lied to me. Every single job. I don't think this is just me. I think this is normal. So you'd reckon I'd learn. But what I need you to do is you need to learn from me. So if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. So the final example of regional education, the final warning I want to give you in these regional universities happened to me earlier this year, like this year, and captures what I call the complete incompetent cruelty that exists in a lot of regional universities at the moment around the world. Now, I love my job at Flinders, but I got offered a very, very senior job a lot of dough, very, very senior job at a regional university. As you're picking up, I have a big commitment to this, so I thought, oh, look, well, let's, let's have a look. Let's see what's going on here. So I was told there are two days of interviews. You know, there is a presentation, there's an interview, you're meeting all these people. So here were the two days, the program of the two days. And that was the process. So I did the process and thought, well, let's see what happens. Cool. But at the conclusion of the process, so we've done the two days, at the conclusion of the process, the Vice-Chancellor and the Deputy Vice-Chancellor decided to add 
other layers to the appointment process. Right, so they invented these additional processes on the day that Steve died. <laughs> they couldn't get through to my phone, isn't that a surprise? And so what they did was they searched the internet, they found my father's name and they found his phone number in the white pages and phoned Kevin. Uh, and then Kev, of course, emailed me, he was too upset to speak, and he said, this university is trying to get in touch with me, but he was too upset to tell them why my phone was turned off. So I opened, not only his email, but I opened another email, of course, the email from the university was in the junk pile, I probably should have learned there, and I discovered what they wanted to do. And look, it still makes me laugh, it is funny, it's darkly funny, but it's funny. And what they decided they wanted me to do <laughs> was an IQ test, like it's 1974. A little bit of black hat thinking. Cool. And so I replied to the email, look, sorry my phone's been turned off. My husband died at 12.20 this morning. Cool. So obviously I did well in IQ tests. I always do well in IQ tests. Doing well in IQ tests show that you do well in IQ tests. Great, not a problem. Easy stuff, easy knowledge. But then, and it gets worse. Okay, so we've done an IQ test. Then, remember this is all happening in the week of Steve's death. A private, private consultancy firm, not the university, a private consultancy firm hired by the university contacted me to conduct, and you need to hang on to yourself, conduct an emotional intelligence test. So what sort of 1960s psychobabble hippie nonsense is this? Now all these staff, you know, this process, we've already done the process, all the staff also decided, oh, they desperately want to meet me again. And look, I'd given them two days of interviews. They had 15 referees to consult. And I remember all of this was going on and on the, the, the night after Steve's cremation, I was sitting in my lounge chair and, and I just was looking out into the backyard and I was thinking, what in God's name is going on here? What is the story? And I suddenly realised and smiled. I remembered the vlog that I did with Steve on the toxic workplace. Some of you may remember this. And Steve told the story that he'd done a two-day interview in a regional university in the United Kingdom. Some of you may remember the story. He was in his full Armani suit and they bust all the candidates out to this regional location and made them wear a hard hat and high vis gear and walk them round a building site. And I said to Steve, and I was laughing during the vlog, and I said to Steve, why did they do that, do you think, Dal? What's the point of that? And he said, firstly, they were inexperienced, so they didn't know what they were doing. But secondly, they were trying to humiliate the candidates. They were actively trying to humiliate them and do an anti-intellectual, anti-academic moment. So you might think you're an academic, you might think you're an intellectual, but you know what? We can tell you what to do. We're the boss of you. So, wow. So suddenly the pennies dropped and I went, that's making a lot of sense to me because why would you give a woman with three degrees, first class honours, two, two graduate diplomas, three master's degree, a PhD, 20 books, 200 plus refereed articles, why would you give that woman an IQ test? What has crossed your mind that you think that's the right thing to do? And of course, what does that suggest about what they think about academics and what they think about university qualifications? And this is a university and they're disrespecting and questioning university degrees. Wow. So why would you want to give a woman whose husband had just died an emotional intelligence test. As we all know from first year psychology, that result would not be generalizable in any form. But indeed, why would you give anyone an emotional intelligence test? Discuss leadership, discuss management, discuss financial planning, but not this emotional intelligence nonsense. 
So why did they do it? Well, clearly, and I'll tell you the story, the Vice-Chancellor was not a career academic. The Vice-Chancellor had worked outside of universities through the overwhelming majority of their career. And the Deputy Vice-Chancellor had had his entire career in another under-regulated regional environment. So all the senior managers were from a very, very narrow discipline as well. They weren't research active. They hadn't taught or supervised in many years. So instead of actually running a proper, professional, accountable, transparent process, they invented a process. They didn't think it through. They were inexperienced. And therefore, they went, oh, look, we've done this, but we need to do this, and we need to do this. And they kept on adding stuff. Yep. Now, the funny bit, the funny end of this story is they were surprised when I turned down this job. <laughs> they were surprised when I turned down the job uh, and they said, well, look, why? And I said, well, look, I was expecting an ethical, regulated, transparent process. Uh, and you tried to conduct an IQ test and an emotional intelligence test on a woman whose husband had just died. Now, that's not right. I can't work for an institution that would do that. Not to me. I can't work for an institution that would do that to anybody. Okay. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem that we have. Until your generation of academics and mine commit to regional education, we're going to be left with this deficit model. We need rigorous and compassionate processes, we need spousal policies, we need family friendly policies, and we also need high quality scholarship so that we can manage this deficit model of regional education. So this is where you, you can create change. This is where you are brilliant, you are socially just, and you can, yes, make a difference. These are great places to live. Housing is cheap, great communities, direct connection with local governments. You can see how your research is changing the world. So you can lead and you can lead well and transform this country from the regions, not by dumbing down, but by lifting up. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.